This is Beyond the Green Screen, an Arizona's Family Originals podcast. Hi, everyone. I'm meteorologist Royal Norman, and welcome to Beyond the Green Screen, the podcast of the First Alert Forecasters. And happy today that our guest is the director of the Arizona Department of Water Resources, Tom Bushatsky. Tom, welcome to our podcast. Thank you for being here. Thank you, and I appreciate the opportunity. I am so into water in this state, which I guess probably ought to be in Arizona. I know you're super into water. In fact, you've had a lifetime of dealing with Arizona water, haven't you? I have. I've been doing water in Arizona since 1982. Wow. And you interned at Water Resources? I was a student at Arizona State University and started an internship in 1982 in the spring at the Department of Water Resources shortly after the landmark 1980 Groundwater Management Act was passed and they were starting to implement that act. Mm -hmm. And then you went to the city of Phoenix for a while? I was at the city for just under 24 years, Mm -hmm. first working in the law department on various water rights and and other issues with the attorneys. And then the last nine years, I was the water policy advisor, so got onto the policy side working with the city council, the mayor, and the city manager. See, there's already so many questions I want to ask you. I I don't want to get sidetracked too much, but law and water, those are tied together pretty tightly. Pretty inseparable. Every water use and some legal link to it in terms of a water right. Uh, So it is really important to be uh, very cognizant of what the law states. And sometimes folks say, you know, Tom, why don't you do X, Y, and Z? I'm like, well, the law doesn't allow me to do that. Yeah. And the law has, you know, for people who are on one side of the coin and other side of the coin, there's law that we have to follow in terms of the regulatory aspects of what we do at my department. Yeah. So... How important is water to Arizona? I mean, there are some people that say it's the most important resource we have. What do you think about it? I mean, is it top one, two, the best? What do you think? So from my perspective, without water, there is no Arizona. Mm -hmm. There's no uh, economic activity. You need water for just about everything you do to make electricity. All the products we make pretty much have water in them. So I think water is the critical element that we have here in Arizona. And we've been very good at managing our water. And we have some challenges that in the past we've been able to overcome. And our uh, charge moving forward is to make sure that we continue to identify and overcome those challenges. And some of the challenges, as we know, have been drought. And this year, a little bit different with uh, the inflow into the Colorado River. It's been a little better. Uh, but we've had some brutal years. And I guess you folks probably just plan like every year is going to be a drought, huh? I mean, I know you get the stats and the forecasts and everything like that, but you got to be worst case planners, don't you? <coughs> and we are. So <laughs> we do plan for the low years. Mm-hmm. And uh, if we have average years, we're happy, but we dance in the streets when we have really wet years. Yeah. So we did have a little bit, uh, a decent Colorado River year, but the trend that we're seeing over the last couple of decades is that we're getting the same amount of precipitation in the watershed of the Colorado River, snow and rain, but it's not turning into flow in the river. And this is a prediction by the climate change scientists. Uh-huh. It is getting hotter. Right. And so there's more evaporation. The soil is drier. So when the snow melts, more water goes into the ground and the trees are growing sooner. So the trees are using more water than they have. And this is a really scary challenge when you get, like in one year we had 80 or 90 percent normal precipitation and 30 percent runoff. Wow, I didn't realize that. we had a little bit over 100 percent and got 80 percent or so runoff. So people ask me one of the things that keeps me awake at night. That's one of them because what the climate change scientists are projecting is coming true. We're already seeing it. And so it's as much – it's – partly drought and maybe that's a cycle that ends Mm -hmm. but the climate change is not a cycle it's going to continue to get warmer right uh, and that warm uh, temperature those warm temperatures result in less water in the river because of the things i talked about soil soaking up the moisture the trees and you get more evaporation of the snow directly into the atmosphere sublimation right is the term and and you get dust because of the drier conditions on top of that snow, which makes that sublimation worse. Melts it faster, yeah. So it's a whole bunch of uh, elements 
of climate change that are connecting together to give us less water, even when you have the same amount of precipitation and rain and snow. So I guess I've, ne- I've never heard that. And that's very interesting to me, that even if we were knocking out the same kind of snow packs as maybe we did 15 or 20 years ago, because of the additional heat and because of the additional dryness, we're not getting the same runoff. Is that right? That is correct. And our really bad year on the Colorado River, uh, the winter of 2022, into the spring of 2022, you remember the prior summer and fall, we had no monsoon in Arizona and very little rainfall in the upper basin of the Colorado River where the snow accumulates and melts to create the river flow. And so the soil moisture conditions were so bad that again, we had probably the biggest delta between the precipitation and the runoff that year that we've seen maybe ever. Yeah, that's amazing. That's amazing. And a couple of years ago, I think it was, Lake Powell got down to one of its dead pool, close to one of its dead pool levels. Can you explain what that is for folks? So again, that in 2022, the two-year projections done by the United States Bureau of Reclamation, who manages the reservoirs on the Colorado River system, projected that we might get down to dead pool. Dead pool means there might be some water left in Lake Powell, but you can't move it past Glen Canyon Dam, the dam that creates Lake Powell. Um, That was actually being projected. Mm. Certain things happened, including the fact that we got a wet winter, but uh, we also conserved water in the lower basin to leave more water in Lake Powell. And in the reservoirs above Lake Powell, they let some water out of those reservoirs. And then we had a wet year. So we took human action to help But there's another also issue that might not be as uh, evident to folks, and that is um, Glen Canyon Dam generates hydropower. Mm -hmm. And when the water level, if the water level was to fall below the elevation at which hydropower is generated, and the way it's generated is there are tubes that go through the dam, right? right? You open a gate, the water flows through the tube, it goes through the power generator. If the water level falls below the level, the upper level of those tubes, no water goes through the tubes. You don't generate power. No electricity. That's a problem because power is a renewable, clean energy source. But beyond that, there are only um, four tubes in the bottom of the dam that you can move water. Mm. So you're hugely restricted in how much water can move between Lake Powell and Lake Mead. And then Lake Mead would start also uh, declining at somewhat of an alarming rate, and maybe to alarming levels. So we have infrastructure issues that we have to match up with the water supply issues to make everything work as efficiently and as well as we can. You do have a lot that keeps you up at night, don't you, sir? <laughs> There's a few things. My goodness there. gracious, that is a, that's just amazing. And, you know, we just read about it, and, and, and then we kind of go, uh, whatevs. And you're like, mm, we're, our water supply is I don't know if the word is getting in jeopardy, but do you ever feel like like when in those dry years that it was getting like time that we are have to maybe do some sort of, um, yeah, I don't know, cutbacks on water usage? So because of all we've done over the decades here in Arizona and elsewhere, people that are in their homes with, you know, the taps that are inside their home, their faucets, their showers, their yeah. sinks, it would take even more uh, outcomes, dire outcomes than have been projected to create problems there. But there might come a time when people are asked to turn off <coughs> the faucets to their outside water use, their mm. landscape or, or whatever. Sprinklers. Sprinklers, yeah. maybe pool, swimming pools. I mean, that's really what was concerning when the Deadpool projections were made in 2022. And I got on... Uh, uh, a rival TV show maybe and and said those things and it was pretty alarming. Yeah. But the other thing about Deadpool or even restricted flows out of Glen Canyon Dam or the thing that's downstream of Glen Canyon Dam is the Grand Canyon. Right. At Deadpool, there's essentially no river flowing through the Grand Canyon. And that's an internationally known uh, wonder of the world, right? And, And I've done interviews with international outlets as well and explain to them that's what this could mean for the Grand Canyon. Yeah. 
that kind of resonates with people who they don't know Phoenix, they don't know the Colorado, right. but they know the Grand Canyon. Right. So you could have risks of real ecological devastation throughout the Grand Canyon if the lake was to get to really low levels. Again, something we have to avoid. So there's a lot of different entities that manage the Colorado River. In, you know, how hard is it to work with everybody to try to get everybody's goals sort of met? That must must be a really tough job. So it it's very difficult. So and it's changed over time. Mm-hmm. So the current operational guidelines for the river were first done in 2007, and that was pretty much the seven states. Mm-hmm. Um, which basically are New Mexico, Wyoming, Colorado, Utah, above Lake Powell and below Lake Powell, Arizona, Nevada, and California. Mexico is involved as well, Mm -hmm. but weren't much involved in 2007. Fast forward, it wasn't long after 2007 that the states realized that the guidelines that were put into place were still putting the reservoirs at risk. Mm -hmm. Uh, maybe historically low elevations if certain uh, flow hydrologies uh, were to come to pass because of the runoff and the snowpack. So we embarked on an overlay to those 2007 guidelines called the Drought Contingency Plan 2019. That was all signed, sealed, and delivered. So it took six years to negotiate that. The last probably three years of that, more of the tribes and especially tribes in Arizona who could have been negatively impacted, came to the fore. Mm -hmm. Now, to look at how the system will be operated after 2026, all these agreements expire. Right. Oh. So so we're in the process of trying to figure out the next phase. We now have 30 tribes Mm -hmm. in the Colorado River Basin, seven states, the United States, and Mexico. And Mexico, yeah. So it's expanding exponentially the number of parties, and the environmental community is more involved, river runners are more involved, even the general public is more involved because of these water issues being so much more uh, in the media, Mm -hmm. both traditional media and social media. So it is challenging, and of course, most of the negotiations really rely on the personal relationships you build. And in 2019, when we signed the Drought Contingency Plan, to add to the 2007 operational guidelines, there were nine people on top of that dam. Seven state representatives, I was one of them, Mm -hmm. two from the federal government. There's only three people who are still working. Oh, boy. One of them happens to be uh, the general manager of the CAP, who then was the reclamation commissioner. Mm -hmm. So only two state representatives, myself and the gentleman from Las Vegas, are still uh, in our jobs, the other folks have either moved on or mostly retired. Yeah. So uh, it's make it makes it difficult when you have that broad of a change. And of course, Mexico has changed over a lot of their people as well. And they just had a presidential election. Yep. The new president will take office, I think, November 1. There might be some more changes with Mexico. So when I say this a lot, to manage that river properly moving forward with all the challenges, and a lot of them we talked about, we need everyone on board. Oh, it's an all hands on deck mm-hmm. situation at this mm-hmm. point. No one group can take responsibility, nor should they. The states have been more traditionally the leaders, but the other groups now, we need them. In Arizona, for example, of the Colorado River water that this state has, half of that water essentially are water rights of the tribes. Mm-hmm. And for the Central Arizona Project, about half of that water is tribal water as well. So we need the tribes to partner with us and they want to partner with us. And the federal government created about a year ago, they call it now federal tribe states, but originally 38 sovereigns. So the 30 tribes, the seven states and the federal government, we have regularly scheduled meetings to talk through these issues, try to find collaborative paths forward. It's amazing the number of people we have to work with. Uh, I want to switch to groundwater a little bit. Tell me the difference between, like, Phoenix and Tucson are, I, I, don't, I don't even know the term, but I'm going to throw it out there. You correct me. Phoenix and Tucson, I believe, are in regulated groundwater areas, and most of the state are not. What, what does that mean? So, basically, in the parts of the state that are not regulated, mm-hmm. 
they still have a standard of putting the water to a reasonable beneficial use, and that's a pretty broad category. Historically, watering lawns is considered to be a reasonable beneficial use, and we won't get into that right <laughs> now. But, so in those areas, pretty much they sink wells. They have to get a permit for us, but our permitting process is to make sure that the construction of the well is such that the aquifer that the well is penetrating is not at risk of being polluted mm -hmm. by improper well construction techniques. So those areas, whoever has the biggest pump can pretty much pump everyone else dry mm -hmm. in kind of the worst case scenario. There's also no reporting requirements. Mm -hmm. So they don't have to tell me how much water they're using. Mm -hmm. I know how big the wells are, right? but that doesn't tell you how much they're actually pumping, right? Do you think that should change? Yes, yeah. we've attempted since 2017 to change that, we haven't been able to get it through the legislature. Mm -hmm. Just just to know the amount of water that either individuals or companies or both are, are drawing out of the groundwater? Right. Farms, companies, yeah. individuals. And so what we hear continually from the unregulated community in terms of reporting their water use is you're either going to take it away from me and move it someplace else, mm -hmm. which is the fear that of the rural people that the big cities are going to come and take their water. Right. Or you're going to tax me. Mm. Um, so those are the, those are what we hear when we have the discussion about managing or reporting their use. And, you know, you can't manage what you can't measure and you don't know. So that we do have indirect ways, you know, through satellite imagery, we uh, contract the United States Geological Survey they do some of these remote sensing techniques and they do some ground truthing and we get estimates. Mm -hmm. But estimates are far from uh, accurate data. Yeah. In the regulated areas, they have to report their water use, except if you're a domestic small well owner. Right. Um, <clears throat> they have mandatory conservation requirements. So the state imposes mandatory conservation requirements in our regulated areas on all water not just groundwater. We're the only state in the Colorado River Basin of the seven states that has a top-down state process for mandatory conservation. Other water providers like Las Vegas, they do it, but mm -hmm. not the state of Nevada, right? So mm -hmm. it's because of the 1980 Groundwater Code, which right. created my department, and knowing that we live in a desert, we've kind of gotten ahead of the curve in a lot of situations. And the other really important piece of regulated Arizona is a requirement that homes, home builders, and developers have to show my department that they have a 100-year renewable supply of water before they can plat and sell homes. Mm -hmm. And that could be Colorado River water, could be water out of the Salt River, Salt River Project, et cetera. But one of the ways you can do that is to pump groundwater as long as the groundwater is replaced. Mm -hmm. The Central Arizona Project has a statutorily created function of doing that replacing. Folks can do it on their own as well. Um, last June, we announced that the groundwater model, so these are complicated numeric models that computers generate after you build them, showed that the water that's there for those purposes has already been allocated or is being currently used mm -hmm. and there's no more to allocate that created a bit of a firestorm mm -hmm. governor hobbs kicked off her water policy council with two charges one is to look at that issue of it's called the assured water supply program when you have to have the 100 years of water for homes and also the lack of regulation in rural arizona mm -hmm. so there were two committees rural groundwater and assured water supply Last December, recommendations were made to the governor. Legislation was negotiated and in some cases um, dropped in the legislature. Those, almost all of those pieces of legislation did not make it through the legislature. So can I just ask you, this is, I'm sure this is an oversimplified question. Why can't we just put the whole state under the regulations that the city and Tucson are on and then everybody will be on the same playing field? Is that so, a dumb idea? It is not a dumb idea. I think the politics, as I described, the legislature not willing to do some things, you know, uh, attends to the outcome of those issues. 
the one size fits all regulation is a little tough too, because remember in Pima, Pinal, and Maricopa County, we have Central Arizona Project, Colorado River Water. In Maricopa County, we have Salt River Project, Surface Water. Right. Many of these areas of rural Arizona that are not regulated rely solely on groundwater. So it's a much tougher or little, different apples and oranges scheme, a little bit, right? Yeah. yeah. And you need to more tailor um, to those conditions. And so what we were trying to create in the Rural Groundwater Committee of the Policy Council was a tool that was more flexible for rural Arizona. Again, we had a pretty good, we got pretty far down the road, but not far enough to get it through the legislature. It's those attempts to get that through the legislature are not done. I'll just say that. Keeping it up. I like that. We will keep at it. That's good. I mean, the 1980 Groundwater Code was, in the short term, five or six years in the making, but in reality, a couple of decades in the making. And and that would be part of your charge, ensuring the water supply for Arizona, if you could get some of that legislation through, correct? Yes, that would, that would be a benefit, and it would ensure uh, more reliability, more certainty, and a more sustainable future for, for everybody. We hear concerns. Uh, from the rural areas that you know big farming concerns are coming in and pumping us dry we have evidence of shallow domestic wells or well that's 100 feet deep going dry Mm -hmm. and those folks who have those wells often don't have the financial resources to deepen their well up their their pump rating so they can pump whatever and uh, a lot of them get stuck hauling water yeah which is hard. So here's what I want to ask us. I'm going to switch gears a little bit, and we kind of talked about this before we started, um, because like I'm I'm the kind of guy that I feel like if I say four or five or ten gallons of water around the house a day, I'm doing a good job. Like, you know, I'm doing the drip irrigation on the garden and all that kind of stuff. And I'm not perfect. I'm sure there's people who do it better than me. Zero scaping, whatever. But then I run into folks that sometimes say. Oh, Saving five gallons of water is nothing, Royal. What do you think about saving five gallons of water? Is it, is it important? I think saving every gallon of water, saving this much water is important. Okay. It, it is a collective resource, and I think there's some obligation to use it as efficiently as possible and conserve as much. People get concerned because they look at how much a farm uses compared to, you know, an acre of farmland and an acre of houses. Yes. And they're like, why should I do something? But it all adds value at the end of the day. Um, And what we want is an outcome in which all of these important uses, because farming is a hugely important use, right? Yes. We need food. Yes. And depending on what kind of food you eat, you consume more or less water in your food. Uh, We have chip manufacturing and other industries that uses water. We export that. We import. Everything we export and import has water in it. Yeah. Like everything. So... It's really important for the homeowner, you know, I shut off my water when I brush my teeth. (laughs) And then when I go to rinse my mouth and do that, I turn on the hot water handle so that I get that water to go out before I jump in the shower so I don't have to turn the shower on as long as I otherwise would. But most, you know, 70%-ish of your water is outside. Yeah. And so... If you really want to make a bigger difference, it's about your uh, watering your landscape. If you have landscaping, make sure that you are uh, doing it efficiently. If you have sprinklers, they're not leaking. You're not watering in the middle of the day when it's 110 degrees and half your water is evaporating and not even making it onto your landscaping. So there's a reasonable bang for the buck. And look, you know, the cities like Phoenix, they're using the same amount of water as they did, and I don't have the, as much data anymore, but as yeah. they were using 10 years ago, yeah. right? So you can do this. You can grow the population with the same amount of water because people are conserving. Yeah. Um, again, we have this statistic from 1957 until I think we're up to about 2020 that we're using 100,000 acre feet less water than we did then. Our population has gone up seven times, yeah. and our economic output, like, 21 or 22 times. So this is all water management, uh, efficient infrastructure, plumbing, appliances, farming techniques. So you can grow a healthy economy 
that is stable. You can grow population that is stable and has reliable supplies. And it's it's all about using water efficiently and conserving water. Yeah, and I, I really do think I've read some numbers recently that, that do say that a per capita usage of water in Metro Phoenix is way lower than 20 years ago. So it it's, it's amazing what has been done. Tom, I really appreciate you being here today. And I love the fact that this bottle of water, if I don't have it today, I'm going to have it for tomorrow. That's a pretty good theory, isn't it? That is, and we need to expand that theory to whole rivers and reservoirs. Well, you got a big job, and I, I'm going to have you back. Again, you're uh, so interesting, so much to talk to about water in this state. Um, good luck as you go forward, and um, keep plugging along for us for this water. Man, we need it. Thank you, and I, I'm very committed to this job. I have... Um, three daughters, two of whom live here, and two granddaughters, and my granddaughters are my motivation, and I look at it not just as my own granddaughters, but everyone's grandsons and granddaughters. You see the gray hair here. <laughs> I mean, I can, I'm can. i pretty much able to leave this job whenever I want, but I want to leave uh, some things in place before I leave and pass it on to the next person who's going to sit in this chair uh, because it's really important to me to do that well it was a pleasure to meet you today thank you very thank much you. for coming down this is beyond the green screen an arizona's family originals podcast